on Business Incorporated today. Egypt is sell to sell stake in state economy. Zambia Eurobond surges after election. And $20 million has been secured for Africa Concessionary Energy. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Ini John McQua. Well, we're starting with intraday market on the African continent. It's mixed sentiment at intraday. As South Africa's GSE index dropped 0.52%, followed by the all share index of the NGX, which shed 0.02%. In contrast, positive was recorded at intraday from Egypt. The EGX 30 was up by a moderate 0.74%, while Kenya closed Friday's trading session in the green with a 0.28% increase. Meanwhile, in the Gulf region, it was also mixed sentiment at intraday. The UAE Dubai financial market added the most, 0.81%, while the Abu Dhabi was up 0.32%. Elsewhere in Saudi Arabia, index fell by 0.13%, while Qatari market was down 0.13%. In Europe, stocks were lower today, tracking Asian markets as investors react to weaker than anticipated economic data and closely monitored geopolitical concerns. Most important topic today, of course, is Afghanistan, which is in the lips of many people in the world, where we have joining us now Conrad from Frankfurt to tell us what's going on from there. Hello, Conrad. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ini. Thanks for having me back. Great to have you back. Well, uh, the whole world is talking about the issues in Afghanistan, uh, where the Islamic Taliban move to take over. Uh, ha Europe has a lot invested in this country for about 20 years now. Is, is everything lost? How is it looking like? Hmm. Very, very difficult to say, Ini. Uh, you know, nobody here in Western Europe would have thought how quickly the complete takeover of, Gava of Afghanistan by the Taliban there uh, really would happen. Uh, this was uh, uh, a complete surprise to most experts. Now some people here believe that uh, some of the Taliban at least might be more moderate than in the past, which means that they should be able to acknowledge that uh, over the course of 20 years a lot of value has been created in Afghanistan and that also in the future it should be possible to create value there in uh, cooperation with countries outside. But of course this might be completely wishful thinking. Siemens is one of the large German companies that really got involved in Afghanistan not very long ago. The company signed an agreement with the government in Kabul to create an energy hub for Central Asia in the country. Now Siemens says uh, we are having second thoughts of course. We are not sure whether this project can continue. Mm. Well, a lot of uncertainty there. Well, uh, let's look ahead now on the financial markets this week in Germany and Europe. What uh, was the outlook? Well, uh, now that the earnings season here is coming to an end slowly, um, the focus of many investors will again more be shifted to the central banks and their monetary policies. In particular, as you know, last Friday, our stock markets here in Western Europe, the German index DAX, too, reached new record highs. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's a lot of concern about inflation. Recently, the Bank of England uh, rung the alarm because consumer prices have risen so steeply in the UK. Here in Frankfurt, our European Central Bank at the moment is not sending any signals yet that it wants to lift interest rates, that it wants to change its monetary policy. But the discussion is, uh, you know, at least getting more intensive. And uh, the question, of course, coming along with it, what a potential impact on the markets might be if, you know, interest rates rise. And uh, the German government has announced that it will sell part of its stake in Lufthansa, which it bought to support the airline during the COVID-19 downswing last year. Has it been a good trade for the government so far? 
Yes, it has any. You know, when uh, the German government bought the shares of Lufthansa last year, the package was worth around about 300 million euros. Now the value of the shares is a bit more than 1 billion euros, so not a bad investment. And I can tell you, even though, generally speaking, business people here in Germany are not particularly fond of the idea of, you know, the government getting involved in business, uh, very few people here believe that uh, last year's policy in the pandemic, uh, you know, to take a lot of taxpayers' money, invest it, give it to businesses, uh, was wrong. Um, on the contrary, this was the right thing to do. Millions of jobs were, you know, kept alive. Uh, structures in business were kept alive so that now every, everything is ready for the rebound, which we are actually seeing happening right now here in Germany. It is documented in very strong earnings reports, very positive economic data, and actually not only from Germany, also from France and Italy, strong data uh, is being reported quite now, uh, right now. All right. Great business idea there, or oh, great business move by the government. Well, thank you so much, Conrad, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Eddie. So let's uh, take some stories from uh, the UK now. British retailer Marks & Spencer is planning to add more guests, clothing and footwear brands to its website, including Fat Face and Jones Bootmaker, after an initial wave of brands increased traffic and attracted new customers. m and chief executive Steve Rowe had earlier indicated that the company was shifting strategy and would sell other brands to broaden its appeal. In January, m and purchased the Jagger brand, and in March, it launched brands at m and selling brands such as Hobbs, White Stuff, Joel's, on its online platform, and a whole lot more. Well, FTSE 100 miner PHB has confirmed that it is in talks to sell its oil and gas division to Australian fossil fuel producer Woodside Petroleum. It came after Australian Financial Review reported that Woodside was in talks with a $20 billion deal. PHB, the world's biggest miner, has been considering spinning off its oil and gas division in part to address concerns over the company's role in the climate crisis. PHB is also selling its last thermal coal mine. And in the market, uh, FTSE 100 was down at intraday 0.97% at 7,148.87 points, while the FTSE 250 was also in the red 0.33% at 23,708.79. In the currencies market, the pound was up against the US dollar 0.02%, up against the euro 0.19%, and down against the yen 0.27%. In Asia, Pacific store slipped today as investors reacted to the release of Chinese economic data for July. Retail sales in March rose 0.5% in July as compared with a year ago, and that's according to official data released today. That was far lower than the 11.5 rise forecast by analysts. Meanwhile, industrial production grew 6.4% in July, also falling short of expectations for a 7.8 year-on-year -year increase for the month. Mainland Chinese stocks Closed mixed with the Shanghai Composite hovering marginally higher at 3,517.34, while the Shenzhen component shed 0.71% to 14,693.74. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index declined 0.8% to close at 26,181.46. And on the Wall Street stock features are lower this morning as contrast tied to the major U.S. stock indexes slipped after data showed China. Chinese economic growth slowed more than expected. The Dow Jones Industrial Average as well as the S&P 500 fell, while the Nasdaq futures dropped 0.25%. But the blue chip Dow and the S&P 500 closed last week at records with muted gains of 0.8% and 0.7% respectively. And this was amid light summertime trading volumes. The tech-heavy Nasdaq Composite underperformed down on the 0.1%. The yield on benchmark 10-year Treasury note was last seen at 1.2%. Bond yields fell as their prices also went up. China's retail sales increased by 0.8.5% in July year-on-year, -year, below the 11.5% economist forecasts. 
Well, in Nigeria, there's a statement by uh, Mr. Femi Adishino, a presidential spokesman, working from home in five days quarantine as required by the Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 after returning from London last week. The president has assented to the bill of the, the petroleum industry bill in his determination to fulfill his constitutional duty. Well, the ceremony is expected to hold tomorrow. The petroleum industry bill provides legal governance, regulatory, and fiscal framework for the Nigerian petroleum industry, the development of host communities and related matters. We have joining us now to comment on this, Dr. Ayodele Oni, partner and chair of Energy Practice Group at Bloomfield Law Practice. Good afternoon, Dr. Oni. Good to have you. Good afternoon. Thank you very yeah. much for having me. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Well, now that the PIB has been assented to by the president, what does it mean? Where do we go from here? Well, it means that the uncertainty ends. Recall, it's a, for investors, a crucial or a critical part of investing is certainty of the legal and regulatory regime. Investors would rather you have a bad legal stroke regulatory regime, which they can na navigate, rather than having a situation where there's uncertainty. You know, because of the issue of the PIB and the fact that people believe the PIB will be passed at some point, it stalled um, investment, CAPEX, um, capital expenditure and new investments, because uh, prospective investors were unsure as to how they would recover their sunk investments. Because what the, what the law does, the Petroleum Act, did do and what you have in the legal regime is beyond just being prescriptive. It also gives you a sense of how you'd be able to monetize your investment and then recover because you've got fiscal terms. One of the one of the tools you'd find in the box of any regulatory or legal regime is the fiscal tool. So if the fiscal tool is uncertain, you would not have investment. So that's one critical thing it does. It does then end the regime of uncertainty in the oil and gas industry. Uncertainty, uncertainty with respect to legal and regulatory regime. Okay, but you know, we still had some parts that were still on the argument, the host community, the one about having companies and all that. What about those gray areas that were not totally agreed upon by stakeholders? Uh, well, the truth is that you, it's difficult to satisfy everyone. It's almost impossible for any law to deal with all the issues or to satisfy everyone. I know there were debates around whether it should be 5%, 2.5%. I think they, they landed on 3%. And do correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, 3%. 3%. Yes. Yeah, 3%. Yes. Um, yeah, 3%. Yes. When the, um, yeah, when, yeah, when both, both houses came together to, to um, um, iron out differences, um, the conclusion was that it should be 3%. I, 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 I think that, I mean, it's, it's an improvement on what we had before now. Uh, because there was no such provision, or apart from what you had with um, the NDDC, where four percent of their operating budget had to be provided to to, to such um, communities. So what you do have now is is an improvement of the previous regime, where the Petroleum Act said nothing. You know, so I think it's an improvement. But I mean, laws can always be amended. It's not it's not cast in stone, but it does to a large extent um, improve. The certainty in, in, in the oil and gas sector. So is this the end of subsidy? Um, well, it, it should be. It's the beginning of the end, I believe. Not the end. Because it does say that um, over a period of time, it, um, the prices should then no longer be pre fixed. I think it's about section two, 205 that sp speaks to um, unrestricted free market pricing conditions. So I think you, you, they'll begin to implement that, that law. And over a period of time, then subsidy should end. But I, what I ask of the government is to then ensure that monies or a portion of monies that ordinarily have been spent on subsidy be used for social safety um, nets to provide for the less privileged to ensure that those who are handicapped have a much better, improved future and quality of life. I think that that's what government does need to do when subsidy does end. And of course, um, solve the problem with the power sector. Then everyone doesn't have to necessarily buy um, what we colloquially call petrol, that's premium metal spirit, every day. Because as long as you say subsidies for the rich, you won't be right if everyone is forced to buy 
petrol every day to run their generator if everybody provides their own energy energy so if we can ensure that the power sector because it's still connected to the power sector largely if you can ensure that the power sector does work then you and i are not forced to buy fuel if middle class and the very rich decide they want to have 10 cars then they would have to pay for it that's one then transportation have other options for transportation the rail system we should do much more than we're doing and renewables so that no one needs to necessarily rely on PMS. As long as there's the obligation to rely on PMS, I, I wouldn't say it's a perfect situation with respect to the removal of subsidy. But whatever is removed now, government then does need to channel it into social programs for the less privileged. Thank All right, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and, and responding at, at such short notice. Dr. Ayodeleoni is partner and chair of Energy Practice Group at Bloomfield Law Practice. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for having me. Have a good day. You too. So we'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll look at major developments on the African continent. Do stay with us. It's Business Incorporated on Channel Television. You're welcome back. Uh, now on the African continent, the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Abwend has issued a call for all eligible civilians to join the armed forces as fighting rages in multiple regions of Africa's second most populous nation. The move comes in response to attacks on federal army comms, and this has triggered a deepening humanitarian crisis in Tigray, where 400,000 people are facing famine-like conditions. Let's bring in Matt Kindiga now, Associate Practice Lead of uh, Sub-Saharan our Africa Front Review to join us and tell us the economic impact of this seemingly lingering crisis in Ethiopia. Hello, Mats. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me on the program. Great. So uh, this, this has been going on for a while now. What's the conflict doing to the economy? How is the economy at this time? Uh, so in terms of how the economy is performing, so, well, well, I think it's worth mentioning that the uh, the economy avoided recession last year. So Ethiopia, fortunately, is coming from a position of strength in terms of its economic performance. Uh, but there is certainly um, a lot more uncertainty caused by the conflict. Uh, so we have seen inflation increase quite steadily. Uh, we are seeing uh, quite a significant risk to agriculture supplies in the north of the country, especially, uh, as well as much weaker investor sentiment. Uh, and this is all sort of compounding the, the fact that the, the government is struggling to meet its fiscal um, goals of cutting the budget deficit. So certainly um, quite a significant challenge being faced by the, the economy at the moment. So how do we see this affecting the economic outlook of, of Ethiopia? Uh, so in terms of um, how we expect the uh, economic outlook uh, developing, um, we're not necessarily expecting a recession in Ethiopia as a result of this conflict. Uh, and this is because there, there are still several industries that will be performing well over the coming uh, year or so. So we do see manufacturing, some services industries, and also agriculture in the south and the center of the country uh, performing relatively well. Um, but uh, there is a significant risk to the outlook if uh, the conflict results in a disruption to trade with Djibouti. Uh, so if the, uh, the Djibouti transport corridor uh, is affected by the conflict, then we could actually see uh, a very rapid deterioration of the economic environment uh, in Ethiopia. So a, a lot really depends on, on the course of the conflict and how, uh, how things turn out over the next six months or so. Okay, so with this sector still active, do we see the pursuing, continuous pursuing of the privatization and economic reform? So, I mean, it's a, it's a good question because uh, the government has uh, made privatization, economic liberalization, uh, the main part of its economic policy over the last five to ten years or so. So we expect this to remain uh, the case. The government will try to continue to privatize industries, especially uh, manufacturing, agriculture, potentially banking as well. Uh, we have seen some success with the part privatization of the telecoms industry with the Safaricom-led consortium winning a bid recently. However, uh, this conflict has already begun to affect investor sentiment. So even if we do see further privatization, so further legislation to privatize industries, um, investors are beginning to uh, become a bit more wary 
of what's going on. So we've already seen MTN, which is a South African mobile network, uh, pulling out of a bid to operate a license in, in, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, and many companies are increasingly worried of the risk of new sanctions. So the U.S. government has imposed uh, very limited sanctions on specific individuals, but there is some anxiety that it could result in um, uh, much tighter commercial restrictions in the future that would affect investor sentiment. All right, Matt. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. You too. So moving on now, Egypt plans to take the first steps early next year towards selling a stake in the state company behind its new capital city in what could be the North African's biggest ever initial public offering. The administrative capital for urban development, a joint venture between the military and the housing ministry, is created to oversee the multi-billion dollar project. And according to the company's head, the project has very big assets and a massive portfolio of land and projects. The new administrative capital is one of several mega projects launched by LCC since he became president in 2014, part of a broader effort to reboot the economy after the uprising a decade ago that oisted President Hosni Mubarak. And in Zambia, Eurobonds gained the most in 14 months, and the quacha surged after opposition leader Hakainde Hichelema shocked landslide victory in the nation's presidential election. Hichelema beat incumbent president by almost 1 million votes and nearly 60% support, the biggest margin of victory in a quarter century and even better performance than his party projected. The margin of victory provides Hichilema with a strong mandate to take on reforms needed to revive an economy wrecked by years of overspeeding, overspending that culminated in the nation becoming Africa's first pandemic era serving defaulter in November, annual inflation is at the highest in two decades at nearly 25%. And the economy is forecast to only narrowly avoid a second consecutive contraction this year. The African Development Bank has reached financial closure on financing agreement for a $20 million concessional investment from the Sustainable Energy and Fund for Africa for the COVID-19 off-grid recovery platform. The regional financier says the five-year $50 million blended finance initiative is designed to provide relief and recovery capital to energy access businesses, supporting them through and beyond the pandemic. The concessional loan agreements were signed with fund managers, alliance head global partners, triple jump and social investment managers and advisors following approval by the board of directors of AFDB. And traders from the East African community would benefit from faster clearance of their goods and lower costs of running their business following the signing of a joint action plan between the EAC and the government of India. The joint action plan will pave the way for a full mutual recognition agreement between the two parties. The MRA, once realized, will benefit companies under the authorized economic operators program run by the EAC partner states under the coordination of the EAC sector since 2008. The selection of India as an MRA partner was based on the principle of mutual recognition and the fairly steady trade between EAC and India over the past five years before COVID disruptions, which culminated to over $30 billion. And uh, let's go to the oil market now. Prices fell more than 1% today, dropping for a third session after official data showed refining throughput and economic activity slowed in China and indicated that fresh COVID outbreaks are crippling the world's number two economy. Brent crude was down 0.1% at $69.58 a barrel. U.S. crude fell $1.08 to $0.67.36 cents $67.36 a barrel. Factory output and retail outlets grow slowed sharply in July in China and missing expectation as fresh outbreaks of COVID and flooding disrupted business activity. China's crude oil processing last month also fell to the lowest on a daily basis since May 2020 as independent refiners cut production amid tighter quotas, elevated inventories and falling profits. And in the metals market now, gold prices edged lower today as the, low, as the dollar held steady, although receding worries about early tapering by the Federal Reserve and concerns over Delta coronavirus variants kept 
billion near a one-week peak. Spot gold was down 0.2% at $1,775.06 per ounce after hitting its higher since August the 6th and $1,782.40 earlier in the session. U.S. gold futures E 0.1% to $1,776.70. The dollar held its ground against major pairs buoyed by disappointing monthly activity data from China. Now, other metals, silver fell 0.9% to 23.52 per ounce. Platinum also slipped 1.6% to 1,009.98. And palladium dropped 1.3% to 2,616.28. Well, that's it on the program. Thank you so much for watching Business Incorporated. I'm Ini John Mekwa.